today on the TMZ Podcast. Welcome to the TMZ Podcast, Harvey Levin here. Derek here. So uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Let's start with Doja Cat. Um, The more I thought about this, the more interesting it became. So she is really angry uh, at one of the stars of Stranger Things, Noah Schnapp. Um, She apparently DM'd him to find out if another one of the stars of Stranger Things, Joseph Quinn, had a girlfriend because Doja Cat was interested in Quinn. Yeah. So she she DMs um, Noah Schnapp. Tells him, hit me up. Tell him, at, at, to ask Quinn. Ask to, Quinn to hit me up. Yeah. And instead, he posts that Doja Cat is interested in Quinn. Mm-hmm. That's messed up. Why? I mean, this kid was so excited. Noah Schnapp is is much younger than Doja Cat, or, he's, or okay, a few years younger say, well, than no, Doja Well, no, no, but it's important. He's 17. In, yes, he is a kid. He was the youngest kid in the first season, and they've all stayed on the show. Um, he sort of looks like a quiet, awkward kid. I don't know what he's like personally, but when he gets the, the DM from Doja Cat, who is a huge, huge global star. Super, superstar, music, musician, he's excited because his response is, Laughing my ass off. This is amazing to get a to get a DM from Doja Cat about uh, her having a crush on on another actor from the show, and I think it was sort of innocent. I think he posted it innocently. So she said uh, he doesn't seem to have an Instagram. He sends her his Instagram, and then he posts it. I think he did it out of sort of boyish excitement. Don't you get a pass at seventeen? She doesn't think so. She she then went on her TikTok and said, "I want to talk about this Noah Schnapp thing. Yes, he's young, but that's borderline snake shit." To be fair, this is like a, a kid. Like, Noah is, like, I don't know how old he is, but there, he's not even over, like, there's no way he's over, like, 21. When you're that young, you make mistakes. You do dumb shit. But the fact that that Noah did that, like, went and posted a private conversation between me and him is so unbelievably, like, socially unaware and whack and, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's like borderline snake shit. I don't know. It seems like you agree. Is there an unspoken code between two celebrities and DMs? Because certainly if they email someone who's not think, a celebrity. I, I, I don't even think it's a celebrity thing. I just think, you know, it, it, I, you know, look, I suppose if the rule is that when you do that, you just know that it goes out to the world. Things live forever <laughs> in social media. Well, no, they, they live forever in social media when they're public, yeah. not when they're private. Yes. What and, if she what if she DM'd someone who wasn't uh, a star of a show and they posted it? Is it different? Does she have it coming then because that person's interacting with Doja Cat? I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> this is kind of a brave new world. Yeah. But it, it just seems like it, she's clearly pissed about it. Yes. So do I guess you just don't do that. I guess if you do it, you have to know that that's a possibility. I think, in, look, Doja Cat is not a, an older superstar. She's She came up in the age of social media. So I think her even feigning shock that this could happen as an eventuality is a little suspect, right? I think Doja Cat knows that this could be posted every time she DMs someone because she's lived in that world. She was raised in that world. If you, you know, you and I are older, we might not think, oh, someone's going to post a private conversation because we didn't grow up in a world where people did that. But Doja Cat did. What do you, that, that's what I, that's what I, I think where she's I, sort I, of I, upset about I am, it is. I am actually at a loss for words on this. <laughs> I am just because it just seems like, you know, it's so funny because I, I don't remember who I read this about. Somebody wrote a, 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 an opinion piece and it really made sense. This was maybe three or four years ago. God, it was an important person too. Um, somebody saying that the right of privacy will eventually be gone, probably sooner rather than later. And in a, in a way... It's probably useful because when pri- it, it's it's weird because privacy. That's odd to think of. Well, it, it's in, it's so odd. It's it's turns, it turns it yeah. turns the world on its head because privacy was kind of a you know it, sacrosanct. It, it was a big it, big issue. Yeah, I mean it it really was the north star, mm-hmm. and now you know it's like the, what this person was writing was at a point when there's no privacy and everything's out, nothing becomes the kind of, you know, it will kill me kind of thing. Right. And it's just radical transparency across the board. Right. So there's no secrets and, and it's and it sort feel- of liberating in its own way. It, it, it's exactly what the article was, that yeah. it was liberating because it wasn't where you're trying to keep secrets like that. Right. And so 
it seems like that's where this world is heading. Yeah, you know, it's eroding. You and I, as, as lawyers, think of it as the expectation of privacy. Where do you have that well, you anymore? Know, and, and, where is the expectation if people have phones and cameras in their hands but, at all times? But here's what's really interesting about it when you think about it. Because the, the just the societal norms seem to be moving away from privacy. Guess what else is moving away from privacy? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court. Yep. Because the U.S. Supreme Court now is on this kick that the word privacy is never mentioned in the Constitution, therefore it's not a constitutional right, and therefore uh, that's why they overturned Roe versus Wade. Yeah. And now, you know, Clarence Thomas has written there are going to be other things that will fall, fall by the wayside as a result. So it's almost like a convergence between the law and society on this, which often happens, by the way. For sure. And that privacy you know, may be a relic. Yeah. We're in the midst of this shift, though, so it seems awkward in some ways. Some people, you know, like that we have more transparency in society, but I think when you get these unintended consequences or, or what people are think as, you oh know, my, my bodily autonomy is at least the last zone of privacy, and the Supreme Court said, no, not really. We're, society we're, can intrude on that. Well, yeah, we're going to move on, but the idea that I just tried to raise this issue with you about that it became something that was important to the Supreme Court, and you brought it back to Doja Cat. Thanks. <laughs> I circled it. Uh, okay. We are going to go to, I, I, I got to say, this this story about the assassination of the former Japanese prime minister is really shocking, and God, I have been thinking all morning about this. You know, in, it, it is almost impossible to buy a gun in Japan. Yes. And this was a homemade jury rig gun that this guy used to kill, to assassinate uh, the former prime it, minister. It had like electrical tape around right. it. It was wild sort of instrument. And and when you look at the security team surrounding him, you know, even though it's a much smaller team than when he had, when he was prime minister, still they were flat footed because it's so not part of Japanese culture or most countries' cultures to do what happens in America. Yeah, and I they think, had something like nine gun-related fatalities last year. Right. We had forty thousand. It's just a, it's, yeah. it's an it's, unthinkable thing there. Yeah, and it's so thinkable in the United States. It almost look. I mean, I don't want to change. I don't want to divert the tragedy of his assassination because it's just horrible. Yeah. but it made me think about the contrast between. Japan and the United States, just in terms of this gun violence, that it was so shocking to happen there. And it, and and even the security team, it's you know, you would think they would be on high alert for this. But even they, when you saw the first shot, yeah. um, nobody knew what to do. Yeah, and I had the same thought when I saw the improvised gun. You know, in, in our civilization or in our society in America, it's easier access to a gun. So if there's a political assassination, you assume it would happen with an instrument that they bought. But maybe it's so difficult to obtain one it that is. this guy had no, no, to no, it is. go into his house. Yeah, it's very difficult. So maybe that was why he had to go into his house and and – you know, tape, electrical tape, it looked like two pipe bombs sort of welded together or something. Um, and so that's why it seems like gun fatalities are are rarer there. And that's that's what's shocking. But political assassinations, I, they hit differently. I, I, do they for you? I, I'm sure you've lived oh, through some God, gigantic yeah. ones. But these are people who, you know, you can think what you want about uh, politicians, but they do devote themselves to public service. They're, they're out there no, in political, some way. Political assassinations are different. Yeah. And because what it is, is it's an attack on the foundation of the country itself. Yeah. Even though this is a former prime minister, still, he was out campaigning. He's the longest serving prime minister. I mean, he's a big deal. He, go he was an international player. Yes. And so, you know, what, the other thing I was thinking about was, and, and look, who's going to know? And I suppose they're going to talk to this guy because they captured him. But has the United States influenced other people to do things like that in other countries? Because it doesn't feel that coincidental it, it feels so, it doesn't feel coincidental that with all the gun violence that's happened here on the heels of that this happens yeah i had the same thought i don't know that they're connected but when you when you that's been the story of most of this year are gun related deaths and mass shootings and then to see a, a political shooting you relate them in your head i'm not sure there's a connection this guy seems like a disgruntled 41 year old i'm sure we'll learn sort of he was an unemployed guy maybe he had some political leanings that were obviously uh contrary to shinzo's but I don't know. It's disheartening. It's become so normalized. Every it feels like a, most let of the stories we're reading. About let me let me let me tell you how normalized. Um, I saw a poll yesterday that was shocking. 
And it was, I, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase all of this, but it was something like, what is the most important thing to you right now or problems that we face? Inflation was dominating. It was something like 40%. Um, then gas prices um, were second. Um, household goods or something like that was third. Um, oh, that's interesting. And, and then you get down, abortion was 5%. Gun violence was at the bottom 3%. What do you make of that? 3%. 3% of people are concerned about that no, and mo- their the, priority? The, and, and the most important thing facing the country right now. And it was just so shocking to me that, you know, and look, I mean, I, I, on a level, I can understand that inflation hits everybody. Yes. And gun violence is theoretical to a lot of people, even though it's much more real than it was before. But still, with 3% on the heels of Highland Park mm-hmm. and Uvalde and Buffalo and, the- and all, it, it, it's... And it's an addressable problem. You know what I mean? The inflation is very complicated. Economics are very complicated. But, the but, Fed's but doing it's not, what it it's, can. It's, it's not about don't... fixing. It's about what do you perceive as the biggest problem. And, you know, to me, look, inflation sucks. Yeah. And what happens in, you know, at least in my lifetime, inflation was really bad under Jimmy Carter. And it got better. And so, you know, inflation kind of goes up and down. Mm-hmm. Gun violence, what we're seeing, this doesn't feel like there's any ebb. It seems like it's going up, up, up. Yes. And when you think, when you really think about what is the most troubling thing, yeah, inflation hurts everyone right now. Right. But this is the fabric of our society. Yeah. And it was 3%. It just shocked me. Yeah. What will it take? I mean, in your opinion, because we're, we seem to be at a critical inflection point. I don't know point. what it Sandy will Hook take. seemed like a what turning it, point, didn't what, it? And we, then it went away and we have more gun violence. If Sandy Hook and didn't Uvalde change. doesn't do it, I, I don't know what does it. It's like, I don't know. There's nothing more horrific than children getting slaughtered. You know, so I, if that I, doesn't do it, you're right. I had a discussion yesterday at the end of the day with our general manager, Stuart Alpert, and we were just kind of sitting in the office. And I, I I was I mean I sounded so you know forlorn about yeah. all of this, but I I have grave doubts about where we're heading in terms of a country and a government and democracy. I just think we are in huge trouble. It's alarming to me that you feel this way. I, I feel like when this comes up, you get into your darkest. I, I think of you as somewhat optimistic about things and about like sort of the the uh, the American dream and and sort of you, you have this orientation that is generally positive and forward moving but you seem like you I, are I, really really uh, in a dark place in a dark place about this and that makes me worried because if you can't find the angle that is well, sort of t- positive and constructive to the gun violence situation I'm more cynical than you by nature and I I've, I've thrown my hands up I'll, as well I'll tell you why I'll tell you why for decades I always thought that the worst year I would ever experience was 1968. I had absolutely no doubt. You know, I, you know know. that I was very involved. That's why I think of you as hopeful. You're a Kennedy guy. I was very uh, involved in Robert Kennedy's campaign. And um, when he was assassinated, it was devastating to a lot of people. And then Martin Luther King was assassinated and there were riots following that. And then there was the Chicago convention where there was, you know, a, uh, uh, at the hands of Mayor Daley, a horrible abusive riot and the Vietnam war and the election of Richard Nixon, all of that together. I mean, that was a positive, but uh, (laughs) I understand now all of that together felt like this country was just doomed. And 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 I felt yeah. it then. Yeah. And I was 18 years old. Yeah. And I felt it then. And Do I you always feel that thought feeling again? I always thought that would be the worst year. And I and 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 the country kind of righted itself in many ways after that. And I always kind of felt optimistic about it because I thought, wow, we could get out from under that then we could get out from under anything. And I really thought that would be the 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 the, the low water mark for my lifetime. This is so much worse than 1968 that I can't even wrap my head around it It, because 1968 was a series of tragedies and terrible things that happened. But in terms of the country, the, the government falling apart, democracy falling apart, I didn't really feel that. In fact, in, in a way, I felt the opposite because young people were making a huge difference when it came to the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. that they were mobilizing people against it. 
this, you didn't feel like Civil War was uh, something you needed to talk about in, at all, in the 60s. At it all. Was a sad I mean, period. you know, you know what Richard Nixon, but, you know what Richard Nixon said back then? I mean, the 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 mantra was America, love it or leave it. Mm -hmm. That's what that was the mantra. And it was a terrible thing to say because, you know, what what he was saying was if you were against the Vietnam War, just go somewhere else. Right. That's not democracy. So that's one of the reasons I really didn't like Richard Nixon, sure. one of them. But um that would get it didn't threaten democracy. Democracy is so threatened right now. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Never in my lifetime, and, and it sounds like not and in your by lifetime, the way, have we seen this type of polarity in the in, in the parties, and it feels like it's tearing the fabric we'll, we'll, we'll of move society on. apart. We'll, we'll move on, but I, I just got to say, I am not optimistic about the outcome. I am not optimistic about the I'm outcome. Not I just have, I, 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 you know, I've just kind of been thinking about what happens in the 2024 election, and you know, what the possible outcomes are and how an election can, you know, how how the loser could end up being the winner. And it's all being set up for that right now, that if but that- Bill Maher calls, calls it the slow moving coup. It's happening right before our eyes. And it is, it's very real. The fragility of democratic institutions is underestimated by by our, our society. And it's, it's strange because you can see the pieces, the chess pieces being put in place and everyone is just sort of idly watching it. See, or, you, you, you say underestimated. I think it was underestimated, the fragility. And now there, is a, there are a lot of people in this country that have embraced the idea of tearing it down. Well, <laughs> well when that's you- That's a dark thought. Am that, I wrong? No, and it's, it's that's a, that's a what dark, a slow that's what the slow moving coup is. Yes, and and the and the idea is let's rig the system so that state legislatures there is now a state legislature where they're trying to get it so the Supreme Court can't review what they do with the electors. Yeah. So no, there's no accountability. So you get people in the state legislature to do whatever they want, regardless of what the vote is. Supreme Court can't oversee it. And they do what they do. How does a government survive that? How does democracy survive that? It doesn't. That's fascism. <laughs> it's 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 horrific. It's horrific. And okay, uh, I don't have much more to say. On it. God, I mean, this is so dark. I mean, well, there's so I, many. I things. know. We just talked about what, the okay. end of American okay. I'm, I'm, democracy. I, I, so I'm where do we move I, next? I, I'm going to give you three things. We can do Brittany Griner, Army Hammer, or Nicki Minaj. We need a palate cleanser. Let's do Army Hammer. Okay. So Army Hammer's in the Caymans. And he, um, you know, he was living there during the pandemic, remember. So he's he's at this resort and there are he has a pal there who apparently works in the sales office where they sell timeshares. And he spends a lot of time there. And we talked to his rep and they told us this. The reason this whole thing bubbled up was there was this flyer that came around that said Army Hammer was a concierge at the hotel. Army Hammer, we talked to the rep. The rep talked to Army. Army said that's just BS. And I believe that, by the sure. way. And so that it's BS. And so then we get this picture from a photo agency of Army at this particular hotel. So then we do find out from the rep, yeah, he spends time in the office there. Um, he has a really good friend there. So, you know, people at the ho at the resort are telling us, you know, he spends hours there. I'll go out and smoke and everything else. And then all of a sudden, this woman who owns a timeshare is saying, Army was showing timeshares to people at the place next door to me. And so... We went back to the rep, and the rep said, I've talked, I've called Army or texted Army, haven't heard back, still haven't heard back. It's been more than a day. So I don't know whether he's doing it or not. If he's doing it, there's nothing wrong with no, it. No, you have to contextualize, though. There's who, nothing who wrong is, with it. Who is Army Hammer to you? Because to most people, he's he's an actor who was in The Lone Ranger and Man from Uncle, and then he sort of well, had some allegations dude, of sexual misconduct. But you on. know who. What is the hammer well, of no, no, Army no, Hammer? I, but, but you're also forgetting social uh, social network. Oh yeah, and Social Network. Oh, obviously, was, it was a that huge was, breakout. That role. was his breakout huge. role. Uh, he played two. Yeah, <laughs> and but but yeah, I mean the Winklevi. The Winklevi. So it, incredible, that, but to you, he's more than just that kid. One of the best autobiographies I've ever read was the autobiography of Armin Hammer, his grandfather, and it's a fascinating book about their life and about his life. And look, they were extremely wealthy. Right. What I am he would be a socialite if not an actor. He'd well, be like a Paris Hilton type. They had uh, that kind of money. But right? no, no, no. But what I'm told is. He doesn't have that kind of money that I've talked to somebody who was. Uh, they're it, one of those families that sort of cut off the he's offspring not and, cut and off. make them earn he's, their own he, way. He's not cut off, but he's not like, you know, the heir. No lack to, of luxury. Right. And so I, I don't think this is even about money. I don't think I believe 
I don't believe Army works at this hotel. Okay. I think he has a friend there, and I think he's been there so much, he probably just steps in if somebody says you want to see something, and, yeah, I'll show you the place. Yeah. I mean, that's Sometimes kind of— your life needs some normalcy and some routine, right? I mean, he was an actor, a big actor, and his career has been a little bit derailed, and who knows if it'll come back. Maybe he just wants something to do. I don't think he's doing it for the paycheck, is what you're saying. He I, may just be doing it because it's an activity you can do when you live on the Cayman Islands. There's not a lot to do. Okay. I, guess. I guess when we agree, we got to move on. <laughs> uh, okay, now your choice, Nikki. Or we should we should do Brittany Griner. Yeah. Um, Back to depressing. I stuff. I am well. No, or maybe I, hopeful. I am really. Uh, I don't understand it. She didn't really plead guilty. She said, I want to plead guilty. Yeah. Now, I don't understand the Russian system of justice enough to understand the distinction, but it sounds like they're continuing hearings in the trial. Yes. So I don't understand that part. The only thing I do understand is that by pleading guilty, I, it, everything I'm reading now is that the Russian government would not even talk about a trade until she until the, tri- until, the well, until the trial was over. Which is essentially fessing up, right? And so, um, but you're right. She said, "I, I, I plead accelerate. guilty, but I didn't intend to break the law." No, no, no. She, she said, "I want to." Ple- she said, "I want to plead guilty." Yeah, and and not it's I the way ple- our system works. <laughs> well, right. You make but, your plea, right? And so, and and I don't understand why these hearings continue. Wouldn't there be just sentencing? It sounds to me. Like, in, especially when you look at what happened, that she writes the letter to Biden. Biden's getting a lot of pressure. Biden now says he's going to do something about it. It sounds to me like there's back channeling going on and that they've already had this discussion. She needs to do this, this, and this, and then we'll do this prisoner. And, and, and they've actually got the guy that they think they're going to swap for, Brittany Griner. Yeah, and usually these diplomatic trades for these sort of trumped-up political trials— um, they're a little unseemly, right? You're doing a trade. Uh, we're trying to get Brittany Griner and well, we did that with we did that with Trevor Reed. We do it all the time, right? I mean, it's 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 part of international relations, but it's it's icky feeling, right? I mean, in some ways, I, I, look, I I think Brittany Griner doesn't deserve to be locked in a Russian prison for whatever minor the, drug offense what, what, she committed. What, what makes it icky it's is icky. Brittany Griner had a tiny tiny bit of hashish oil, you know, in her bag, right? If we release and a we're very trading, dangerous person. And we're yeah. trading her, which, you know, we want her back, but we're giving back to them this merchant of death. Yes. And horse trading seems it feels like, to you know, justice. You know what it you is? Know. It just feels like we gave more than we got. Yes. It seems like we didn't have enough leverage because it's a big deal that we have a big athlete over there. And when her crime was so minor that you, that but we're going to give up someone who is potentially very dangerous and shouldn't be out on the loose in order to get her back. The other optimistic way of looking at it is Americans value American people who are wrongly held in yes. other countries so much that they will do something like that to get an American back. Yes. And it almost in a, in a way it, it, it does honor to the system our values that we value americans who were wrongly held so much that we would do something like that yeah i like that spin you find see that's what see, i mean about opti- you you sometimes have a manner of putting an optimistic hopeful spin on things that uh i don't yeah. <laughs> i don't have that gear then help me out next time because we got to figure out america <laughs> okay oh, God. have a good weekend everybody All right.